Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather with us on this 30th of December. As always, we encourage you, your family, your community, and your village to stay up to date with your local weather situation in Alaska. And we give you a lot of different ways to do that. Whatever is convenient for you, do that again. 1-800-472-0391 is your Alaska weather information line. That's toll-free, a call free for you anywhere inside Alaska. Write that number down and then write the numbers down you use to access your forecast as you go along. And you can use that a lot faster and you don't have to wait for the telephone prompts every time. Weather.gov slash Alaska is our statewide web page. One click on that will take you to your local weather forecast office in Fairbanks, Juneau, or Anchorage that covers all of Alaska. And from that page, click one more time, you'll get your localized forecast there. You can bookmark that page and use it the next time without having to hop through the hoops. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you find me. I'm happy to serve you any way I possibly can uh, with the science and weather around our state. If you have questions about our services, whether it's aviation, river forecasting, ice coverage, or uh, tsunami information, I'm happy to help you any way I can, and I'm happy to share images with you if you have trouble finding them on our site. Here's what we see tonight. Nothing going on really in southeast yet. It's not, not for the total weekend that's coming our way. It does look like the weather's going to change significantly for southeast as we get into Wednesday, Wednesday night, and into Thursday. Totally different than what we see here right now. Uh, we do have uh, some strong winds on the uh, outer coast there, so gales are up for many locations there. But let's go a little bit further westward for now because the first focus we'll see is a winter weather advisory for the eastern Alaska range, mainly due to wind. Not a whole lot of snow falling, but it could create some poor visibility tonight and in through tomorrow. We still have a flood advisory out for the Willow area, so you probably know about some of the flooding happening around Willow uh, due to an, an ice jam there on one of the rivers on Willow Creek. Uh, that looks to be a long-term issue, and uh, again, you can get some more information from your local news outlets there, but uh, flood advisory continues for that area, at least for the uh, near term. As we look a little bit further north, a lot of what you see is winter weather advisories all the way down through the uh, Koyukuk Valley and into the lower Yukon, uh, mainly due to accumulating snow. Uh, generally thinking about uh, about three to five to about four to eight inches of snow, and kind of a heavier band here up through Galena, Bettles, Tanana down toward McGrath. Uh, most of these areas have the opportunity of seeing at least accumulating snow uh, for the uh, short term uh, tonight and into tomorrow. Just to the south of that though and just a little bit to the east is where we get into the winter storm warnings. More on that in just a second. But first out here around the Chukchi Coast and the northern parts of the Seward Peninsula and through the Bering Strait and the St. Lawrence Island, Blizzard warnings are in effect. They'll be in effect at least in through tonight and early tomorrow morning around 6 a.m. or so, uh, mainly due to the wind. Uh, not a whole lot of additional snow is expected to fall, but visibility is down and blowing snow is the main issue there with uh, wind gusts that could be upwards of uh, 60 miles per hour at times. So pay attention to that. Poor visibility, blizzard conditions here for the Bering Strait communities and the Chukchi Coast. Conditions should improve as we get past tomorrow morning there around our St. Lawrence Island communities and the west coast through the Bering Strait. Now back to southwest, uh, the red shaded areas here are a winter storm warning. And again, we have a winter weather advisory down here for the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, generally speaking, about six to 10 inches of snow is expected here around the Alaska Peninsula, all the way to the north of uh, Kaliganek, um, Togiak, and Dillingham. Generally in this area here, uh, and maybe even including Lake Iliamna, we could see as much as 10 to 20 inches of snow. You heard me right. 10 to 20 inches of snow is going to be a, a fairly narrow band. A lot of this is probably going to be occurring north and east of Dillingham and probably around Lake Iliamna all the way up toward the Antioch Sleep Mute area. So uh, plan on accumulating snow. The good news is a lot of that may miss Dillingham for the most part. If that's the case, no big concerns there. But if you're underneath that band of snow, uh, which is not the entire shaded area of red here, you could come up with about uh, almost one to two feet of snow. So uh, potential for some of that to fall there. For the further southern areas there along the Alaska Peninsula right now, it looks like that could be on the order of about six to ten inches of snow. Uh, maybe uh, four to seven around the Bethel area northward, you could see a little bit more, as much as 15 inches of snow on that north and western side there. So uh, certainly room for about one to two inches. I'm sorry, one to two feet. <laughs> Get that right. It'll be more than one to two inches. Here's a look at the satellite picture, and maybe this will help you conceptually understand what's happening with our weather right now. Above our heads 
is a very pronounced trough of low pressure in the upper atmosphere. At the lower levels, we have this train of low pressure that keeps working in from southwest to north and east. At the moment, it's grabbed in a tremendous amount of moisture working across the Gulf of Alaska and pushing that northward. In fact, many locations have seen temperatures come up significantly over the last couple days. Uh, that's pushed temperatures in south central above freezing, enough so anyway, for rain to fall. In the interior, Fairbanks has come up to about zero from 40 below just several days back. Uh, southeast is still looking at rainfall in the region, but again, as this whole boundary changes over the course of the week, it looks like the intense uh, bands of precipitation may be passing through, but with much colder weather, and that could mean snow at much further uh, southern latitudes than what you've already seen up around Haines and Skagway and even Yakutat earlier in the season. As we look at the loop one more time, if you look out west, you can see northerly winds are really holding on across the Bering Strait and most of the central and western chain. Uh, no no uh, thought that that's going to change anytime soon. So for ice growth, that means that trend should continue and we'll continue to see ice moving further and further south. Concentrations are picking up. Uh, thickness is not uh, changing a whole lot. So again, there's a lot of very new ice out there that is not very thick, but it is new ice coverage. And that, of course, is very important. As we look at today's weather map, here's low pressure already moving toward the interior up across the Alaska range to the south and west. A 972 millibar low that is still helping to pump in warm and wet air in the south central and the Gulf Coast. One front moving in. Now, widespread areas of generally light snow. The, the main band is right here just to the uh, west of this cold front that's working across southwestern Alaska and pushing into the interior. That's where that 10 to 20 inches of snow is going to come from. As we head into tonight, that trend will continue. Watch for areas of blowing snow and again, blizzard conditions around St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait. Areas of accumulating snow all across south and western Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula. Out ahead of that, warm air, showers, rainfall across Prince William Sound down toward Kodiak Island and for parts of southeast. As we get into Tuesday, low pressures working up through the Kenai Peninsula. 972 millibar low there, and notice how that cold air is wrapping around. A wall of the wild, this is going to be traveling north and east and pulling that cold air in and actually further northward as it goes and pushing that warm air further and further east. In the southeast there, you may see some scattered showers, uh, primarily the snowfall, heaviest at times across some of the higher terrain, and that band of snow is still holding in across southwest and parts of the northern interior. We'll continue to see the opportunity for blowing snow. It does look like conditions should improve around the Bering Strait there. Blizzard conditions are not expected to continue uh, into the afternoon there tomorrow. Uh, for Wednesday, low pressure is still creeping eastward. It really hasn't moved much in its position, but you'll notice the effect of that cold air spreading around is still moving eastward. And for right now, it looks like most of Wednesday will be mild enough for southeast to see generally rainfall conditions there. But it looks like by Wednesday night and Thursday, that's going to change very quickly. And by Thursday, a lot of that cold air will be in place. And you may see some uh, pretty intense snow showers passing through a large part of southeast as we get into Thursday and Friday. For now, it looks like that main band of snow traveling up through Cook Inlet and parts of the Alaska Range and south central could include Anchorage there if the winds turn just right. Areas in the Matsu and certainly the Kenai Peninsula. So if you're traveling uh, very late on Tuesday night, New Year's Eve, or perhaps New Year's Day itself on Wednesday, make sure that if you're going to be on the road system, you have a good way to check the weather and check the road conditions. 511.alaska.gov is a great way to do that. Check out their new website if you haven't recently. Out across the Chukchi Coast and the Bering Strait, snow showers continue. Northerly winds continue. It's going to be cold, no question about it. And the winds are going to stay up across the Brooks Range as well. Let's take a look at some of the temperatures that we see at this point. For Tuesday morning, still fairly mild across southeast. 30s and 40s for you. Uh, for South Central and uh, Prince William Sound, lower to mid-30s there. In fact, some places like Cordova and Kodiak will be pushing the 40-degree mark. Much warmer across the interior. Again, as that southerly wind works up over the Alaska Range into the middle Tanana Valley, four degrees above zero in Fairbanks, 11 below in Fort Yukon. That again is substantially warmer than last week. Teens and 20s below zero for the North Slope, all the way from Ambler down toward Galena, south and west toward McGrath. Uh, seven below around Macoria, Gamble and Sabunga also still looking at sub-zero temperatures. St. Paul, 13 above. South and west, teens and 20s there. It looks like high temperatures on Tuesday will make it back into the teens and 20s as well. Hovering close to zero around Bristol Bay, uh, Bethel about 11 below, Galena 15 below, Nome 8 below, 9 below for Ukiavik, 5 above for Arctic Village, 13 above in Fairbanks, and 30s and 40s, again above zero, above freezing I should say, 
for the Susitna Valley, for Anchorage, for Kenai, for Prince William Sound, all the way out toward Gulf Canada before you actually get into some of that really, really cold air. And then 40s for southeast. Overnight lows Wednesday morning, again, not that cold as it was before across the northern interior in the west. Uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 below in the west, 15 below for Utkiavik, 30s for southeast, south central in the teens and 20s. And then we get into Wednesday afternoon, it's a little bit cooler for south central and parts of the Copper River Valley southeast, looking at temps in the 40s. Uh, a little bit milder in the west, anywhere from 5 to 10 below. Nome looking at 4 below. Uh, Point Hope, Point Lay, all looking about 10 to 15 below up toward Wainwright and Nukiavik, uh, holding around 10 below. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And back with a look at your aviation weather now for Tuesday morning. Expect widespread IFR across the north and eastern Gulf Coast all the way around to Kodiak Island surrounding a broad area of low pressure here in the Gulf and of course under a broad area of low pressure in the upper levels which you'll see here in the jet stream map here in just a moment. We're also expecting to see IFR across the north slope and especially the Chukchi coast. A little bit of that pulling inward toward the higher terrain here as we get eastward along the Beaufort Sea coast. Uh, hit and miss marginal conditions across the eastern Alaska range up through Denali and Healy up the Parks Highway and into the uh, flats there you'll probably start to see some of that breaking up and it could include areas around Fairbanks as well. Watch for some breaks in the marginal conditions there across the Yukon Delta into the Seward Peninsula and the Chukchi Sea itself with IFR pulling into Bristol Bay. You can see most of Bristol Bay is covered up and then west of Adak and Atka we're looking at VFR conditions out there. That should continue through the afternoon. No big changes here across the Gulf but you might see some improvement across southeastern Alaska. Prince William Sound up through some of the past including Tanita Pass, looking like IFR there. Southwest Lake Iliamna, all the way out toward Cape Newenham, uh, south from Port Hyden, and uh, areas up through McCorrick, just about still looking at marginal conditions. As we get into the north slope, most of the slope will be IFR. Most of the Beaufort Sea coast will be IFR. Areas out toward Kaktovik, though, may sneak in under VFR, it looks like, uh, through Tuesday afternoon. Uh, you'll go back into marginal conditions by Wednesday morning, looking for IFR from the Brooks Range southward toward southwestern Alaska, all the way out toward St. Matthew. Also looking for areas of IFR extending into Prince William Sound and especially the outer coast of southeast. Uh, places like Haines, Skagway, all the way down toward Hyder might sneak in under marginal conditions and IFR will be passing through parts of Kodiak Island. That may continue to hover very close to marginal, if not IFR levels for Wednesday afternoon. Areas outside of Prince William Sound looking to be IFR, the Barren Island region there through Cook Inlet also looking to be IFR, uh, Lake Iliamna all the way down toward um, oh, Cold Bay, Falls Pass, and King Cove also expected to hover close to IFR, if not marginal, all day long. And then most of the Yukon Delta, the Koyukuk Valley, Galena out toward Deering, and Nome uh, should hold around IFR conditions most of the day. Here's your pass conditions for Tuesday then. In detail, Anaktivik and Adigan Pass I think will clearly be IFR for Tuesday. Maybe some changes there on Wednesday. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass holding an IFR throughout your day. Rainy Pass also looking to be IFR. Windy Pass, marginal conditions throughout the day. Isabel Pass leans over toward IFR as we go. Mentasta Pass does the same thing, heading toward IFR as we get into the afternoon. Tanita Pass starting at a marginal, probably worsens uh, throughout the day. Uh, with a disturbance holding in the Gulf, we'll keep IFR in place for Portage Pass and maybe some minor improvement around Chilkoot and White Pass as we go, uh, perhaps looking a little bit better there on Wednesday. Freezing levels show that surface freezing line holding right through Shellacoff straight up through Cook Inlet and then dropping over toward Haines and Skagway. The two and 4,000 foot levels are sitting right over southeast Kodiak Island and the Kenai Peninsula. Everything else sub-freezing at this point. Uh, what that means for icing potential is we have lower levels there across southeast and the eastern Gulf uh, between about three and 7,000 feet and higher for Gulf Coast communities. But it gets a little more complicated as you move inland, uh, anywhere from about 8,000 feet above for areas around Fairbanks and north and below 4,000 feet. There's a patch there that icing will not be very significant at all. And then above 5,000 feet as you get into some warmer air up above the North Slope. So again, checks, uh, check your conditions before you head out and again, expect some changes as we go through Tuesday and Wednesday. The jet stream right now has a broad area of low pressure across the Bering that's driving in some very active weather into the Gulf and then sending that into the uh, North American West Coast. Uh, broad southerly flow though is riding over most of Alaska right now, 65 to 70 knots. The main action though is just south of the region, so we're stuck in a lot of the cold pattern. Low pressure over Bristol Bay giving us southerly flow for the interior and southeast 
East, anywhere from uh, 25 to 50 knots over southeast, and northerly is coming down through the Bering Strait, 30 to 50 knots there, 40 to 50 across the Alaska Peninsula. Patterns generally the same there at 3,000 feet. Speeds are a little bit stronger out across some parts of uh, the upper Koyukuk, around 40 to 50 knots there. Southerly is a little bit further eastward, anywhere from 15 to 30 knots, and southeast looking at lighter winds here at around 10 to 15, with the strongest winds out of the Alaska Peninsula and over St. Paul and St. George, 35 knots over the north slope from the north and northeast. Looking at turbulence then, the main focus should be across the western Brooks Range, the Seward Peninsula, and Yukon and Kuskokwim Deltas, below about 4,000 feet for most cases there. South Central, it looks like the main considerable moderate threat will be over the Prince William Sound, Kenai Peninsula, Cook Inlet down through Kodiak Island and Shellacop Strait, and hit and miss across the Alaska Range. No significant signal for turbulence for southeast or most of the interior. What we're looking at is a legacy of the Ice Age. Permafrost and methane is a time machine. So what we're going to do is walk back in time. We're going to see old carbon, old bones, old environments, and none of those are in equilibrium with today's climate, so that's the problem. That world doesn't exist anymore, and it hasn't for 10,000 years. It was nicely and very delicately separated from this modern, warmer climate by about this much moss. And when that moss goes away, whether for fire, or for human disturbance, or for warming, and all hell breaks loose. Permafrost. It's maybe the part of the cryosphere that's most out of sight and mind. It's fascinating how it formed in the first place and how it got loaded with so much carbon. In a minute, we'll go back underground with Matthew Sturm from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. But first, let's meet Peter Griffith, NASA's project manager for the Above Campaign, which supports more than 70 science projects studying forest and tundra vegetation, wildfires, animals like birds, caribou, and doll sheep, methane emissions from expanding northern lakes, and the impacts of climate change on people in Alaska, Canada, and around the world. Many of those projects have some direct connection to permafrost. Permafrost is the hidden cryosphere. It's the permanently frozen soil that surrounds the Arctic all across Alaska, northern Canada, and then across Eurasia. The ground has been frozen during the ice ages. During the Ice Ages, there was not enough snowfall in the drier regions of Alaska and Canada to form glaciers there, so the land was suitable for vegetation. What happened is that over thousands and thousands of years, all of that plant material got compacted and frozen every winter and buried and pushed down, so that today there's 300 feet deep of frozen water and dead plants and some pieces of dead animals too. Sometimes you find you know, woolly mammoths <laughs> in the permafrost. But most of it, of the organic matter, as we call it, in the permafrost is um, frozen plant material. Some of that plant material is now thawing and decaying, releasing its ancient carbon into the atmosphere, sometimes in the form of methane gas bubbling out of expanding northern lakes. We started this fuel campaign uh, because the Arctic is the part of the planet that is warming first and fastest. And there are consequences to this for permafrost. So during the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, we're studying permafrost with people on the ground, from aircraft flying over the region, and also from satellites in space. Another way to understand the permafrost is to take a walk below ground with Matthew Sturm and into the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permafrost tunnel. And they've dug this, this tunnel back into the side of a hill about 200 feet, and it goes sort of sloping down so that by the end of the tunnel, you're about 100 feet underground, and you're surrounded by 
bones sticking out of the wall from the steppe bison and the mastodons that are frozen in it. There's sticks that are 40,000 years old, you know, that you can touch with your hand. There's grass that's still green that's tens of thousands of years old because it got frozen, you know, right away and it's never lost the, the, the green color. But as fascinating as it is to see these relics of an ancient era, or to see a tree split in half by thawing soil, or even to light a ball of methane on fire from under winter ice, at the end of the day, Peter and his colleagues want to know just how much organic matter is frozen in that permafrost, and how fast it might be released. Currently, we, we think that there is something on the order of two to three times as much carbon locked up as frozen organic matter in permafrost as there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So releasing all of that organic carbon from permafrost into the atmosphere would be a real game changer. That would be a tremendous transformation of the planet's atmosphere. Now, the good news is that it would take a very, very long time for that to happen. However, we are warming the planet uh, at a rate now that calls into question how quickly is that uh, changing and what the consequences uh, in the near future and in the far future are going to be. You're in the middle of a field somewhere in California at four in the morning. It's sort of surreal in a way because you've put so much time into it for so long and, and actually seeing it over there is like <laughs> Whoa, you know, it's, uh, it's a big deal. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with a look at your sea ice edge, we continue to see growth moving southward now. You can see new ice forming south of St. Lawrence Island and marginal ice well ahead of that. Also marginal ice west of Macquarieuk and uh, areas out into the Bristol Bay. New ice forming along some of the southwestern capes. One thing to note, there's still marginal ice and some open water north of St. Lawrence Island. So that situation is still not... 100% yet. We're still looking for new ice to fill in right here. Uh, one thing that um, Alaska Sea Ice Program forecaster Mike Lawson passed on to me today was that as this ice is moving southward, it's also moving into warmer water where water temperatures there are not supporting new ice growth just yet. So while ice is moving south, it may also be melting as it works into some of that warmer weather. You can check the latest forecast anytime you like as well as this analysis and more at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. On into southeast, now look for winds 10 to 20 on the inside passage. You're looking at 4 to 8 feet seas across the region. Uh, Clarence Strait looking at some of the higher seas there and across the outer coast. Seas ranging from 17 to 19 feet on that south and southeasterly flow, 15 to 20 knots on Tuesday. For Wednesday, the front comes in. We'll start to see some initial changes there for more precipitation, but the big cold doesn't come in until Wednesday night and Thursday. 15 to 20 knots from the south and east on the inside Wednesday, looking for 4 to 7 feet there, and anywhere from about 21 to 24 feet uh, with 25 knot winds sustained as we get into Wednesday afternoon. Tuesday in South Central, southeasterly is inside of Prince William Sound, 25 knots and 6 foot seas. Uh, light winds across the north parts of the inlet for uh, Cook Inlet region, but you're looking at southeasterlies that are picking up 25 to 30 with 7 to 14 foot seas, the higher seas outside across the north and western gulf. You'll see more of a westerly flow pulling into that low pressure system and the front. As we get into Wednesday, southwesterly is inside of Prince William Sound with a 3 foot sea, 16 to 19 foot seas across the north and western gulf. South and westerly is coming up Cook Inlet and strong westerly winds, the storm force uh, winds coming across the western barrens at uh, 14 feet uh, with 50 knot winds and 30 knot winds coming up Cook Inlet with a six foot sea there on Wednesday. For Tuesday in the Alaska Peninsula region and Bristol Bay, northwesterlies at 40 knots with 12 foot seas, 19 foot seas coming down the coast. Looking at northwesterlies on the eastern side of the Alaska Peninsula, gust of 40 to 50 knots easily, 17 foot seas in the region with 18 foot seas east of Kodiak Island and southwesterlies steady at 25 knots with six foot seas inside of Shelikoff Strait, becoming westerly at 30 with eight foot seas on Wednesday. Westerlies also picking up in the lee of the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, 40 to 45 knot winds there, with 14 to 22 foot seas expected in the region. 14 foot seas inside of Bristol Bay, outside of the ice zone there, and northwesterlies coming down the Bering 
coast with a 40 knot wind and 16 foot seas on Wednesday. For the Aleutians, northwesterlies continue. We'll look for some of the strongest winds north of Unalaska at 40 knots with an 18-foot sea, uh, 12 to 16-foot seas across the central and eastern chain and across the north and west, 15 to 20 with 9 to 12-foot seas on Tuesday, becoming southeasterly from Kiska to Shemya with a 35-knot wind and 9-foot seas. Look for northwesterlies across the central and eastern chain, 20 to 30. Uh, seas ranging from 8 to 10 feet on the south side, on the north side, in the Bering Sea coast, up to 16 feet there north of Unalaska and Nikolsky. Across the west coast, northwesterly is still working through Norton Sound at 25 knots. Northerly is coming across St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait all the way down towards St. Paul and St. George, anywhere from 35 to 40 knots. Expecting 11 to 13 foot seas in the region, 14 foot seas around the Pribilovs on Tuesday, coming up to 16 feet on Wednesday. Northerlies continue coming down the west coast, 40 to 45 knots with 11 to 12 foot seas for the most part, 14 foot seas though, out around St. Matthew. And for the North Slope, east and northeasterly winds all the way across the Beaufort, 15 to 20. Northerlies across the Chukchi over the ice, you're looking at about 20 to 35. And again, still a little bit of open water across the Bering Strait down towards St. Lawrence Island there with a nine foot sea, 11 foot seas there on Wednesday, 45 knot winds expected. Northerlies across the entire region, in fact, 15 to 20 for the Beaufort and 25 to 40 for the Chukchi coast on Wednesday. Tonight's forecast calls for low pressure across the western Gulf of Alaska. That keeps a very warm and wet air mass across southeast and south central, and chances are you'll see a little bit of rain in this region. Just to the west of that line, though, it is cold enough for a wintry mix around Cook Inlet, and to the west of that, periods of heavy snow. Winter storm warnings for as much as 10 to 20 inches of snow across the lower uh, Koyukuk, all the way into the uh, upper Kuskokwim, and parts of the Bristol Bay region, generally north and east of Togiak and Dillingham and Kaliganik. This will trend northward as we go through tomorrow, the last day of 2019. Low pressure continues to drag a lot of warm air eastward and cold air in from behind. And what that means is it may snow around south central and probably snow in southeast by the end of the week. Happy New Year. See you next time. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.